What's up guys, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. With so much going on in the news, I thought I would devote today's episode to a little bit of an update on just what's going on in the news. And in particular, I'm just going to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in the tech sector. And uh, we have got Twitter it seems to be going through a meltdown since Elon Musk has taken it over. Now, the guy seems to be possibly overreacting to the fact that he spent 44 billion on the purchase of this prop of this company. I was going to say property. But Elon Musk has spent 44 billion of his fortune buying a company that is losing 4 million a day. And so he has a lot of problems on his hands, but he doesn't seem to be bringing a, a huge amount of sort of control to how he's addressing it. And what he's done is he appears to have spooked the market or certainly the advertisers that advertise on the platform. And by going out and kind of making these sort of statements that shock people that are the advertisers of this world, a lot of them now have basically put on hold advertising. So at the same time, he's trying to sort of stem the losses that he's making uh, in the company. And so last Friday, he laid off half the workforce in Twitter. That's more than 3,500 people laid off on a Friday evening. And they suddenly found that they didn't, didn't have access to their computers. A uh, bit of a mess, basically. And um, no sooner has the weekend passed and the guys have had a chance to actually review who was fired they suddenly now are actually reaching out and asking some of the people who were fired on Friday, asking them, could they come back to the company? So it does seem like there's just, there's a huge amount of um, self-inflicted wounds here. And it's a little bit surprising. Anyone who follows um, Elon Musk's you know, career and they saw what he did in PayPal, they saw what he've done in SpaceX, they see what he's done in Tesla, the guy is very clearly an incredible engineer and uh, and businessman, but he seems to be good at the whole engineering side of it. Mm, I wonder, is he good at what he is up to now in Twitter? Anyway, time will tell, but it has been really interesting to watch. Now, in the meantime, the other big tech news is Meta, formerly known as Facebook. They are actually on the verge of announcing themselves tens of thousands of layoffs is what I've heard. And now I think they employ something like 70,000 people. So they can afford to lay off tens of thousands, but the, the, the market has been in a big way spooked by the, uh, the losses that um, Mark Zuckerberg has racked up inside of the tech sector. In, in, in that particular company, he obviously makes billions on advertising and stuff, but the advertisers have been cutting back because of the recession. So they're losing money on one side of the, or they're losing, I suppose, they're, they're, they're forced with, they're facing a revenue drop on one side of the business. But meanwhile, on the other side, the metaverse, the so-called so metaverse, as he likes to call it, which is his big vision of the, um, of the future of AI and augmented reality, um, artificial and not artificial intelligence, but um, uh, virtual reality. And all of this stuff, anyway, he is investing literally billions on this. And it's he, he said so far that he will continue to lose billions on these bets because he's investing in the future. Now, an awful lot of big investors have decided that they don't actually believe that he knows what he's doing here and they think that his sort of borderline obsession with all of this is dangerous for the business and so they've been voting with their feet and they've been pulling out and meta which was the darling of the stock market not so long ago has lost 73 percent of its value year to date and so you can imagine if you're a big pension fund and you wanted to own these shares in companies like you know meta and google and all of these different companies to lose 73% of your holding is just insane uh, in this day and age. And so, and now they are not alone, by the way. I saw this interesting, one of our previous guests, Daniel Priestley, he did a, an interesting tweet today, ironically, another tweet. And it was all about companies that have lost money this year. And there's an enormous amount of companies that are losing huge sums of money. And you have Peloton, which was the darling of the... Uh, 
um, of the pandemic, which did the exercise classes in your home and you went and you ordered a special bike to be delivered to your home where you could participate. That's lost something like 90% of its value. Zoom has lost 70% of its value. Uh, just so many companies, they're just losing so much for it. So it's a real tech sector meltdown taking place at the moment. And this is pretty much in line with what was predicted earlier in the year, but a lot of people were paying sort of no attention to this because they had this kind of perpetual exuberance around the market. Another thing that's happening as of this week, like just kicking off today, is COP27. Now, I find it hard to believe that we are already in COP27. It's not so long ago, or certainly it doesn't seem so long ago, that I did a whole episode on COP26, and that was last year in Glasgow. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, COP is the uh, annual climate action, um, and get, they get all the governments together to basically try to hammer out deals on reducing greenhouse gases and emissions and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's a massive conference. It's a very important conference, but you have to be a little bit kind of disappointed with what's happened with it over the last couple of years huge amounts of hot air basically <laughs> and that's kind of ironic given that we're talking about emissions hot air but the reality is is that there's all of these huge promises yes we're going to reduce uh, our emissions and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and then you find out that actually the promises they haven't been backed up in any way and it's not surprising given what's happening in ukraine to a degree, you know, people did not expect their gas suddenly to become, to be switched off. And so it's very hard to move to alternatives when something gets switched off just uh, sort of overnight the way it has done. Now, there's been a lot of political sort of fallout for Rishi Sunak, who was saying that he was not, you know, he was going to focus on the uh, agenda back home in with the UK economy. And he said that he would pass on the COP27 and he came under enormous flack for that. So he changed his mind and said he is actually going. And of course, Boris Johnson didn't pass up on the opportunity and he is already over there um, at the moment. And so it's just, it's disappointing to see how they all jump to it because of the po politics, politics involved. But when it actually comes to whether something's actually happening or not, it's kind of a different story. And it's a little bit like if we, if we talk about kind of uh, metaphors around this. If you think about fast change versus slow change, when you're in a situation where something has ch rapidly changed overnight, like if, you're, if your house is, in, is burning down, that's a rapid change. You need to act instantly in order to try to fight that. In the case of Ukraine being invaded by Russia, that's an overnight decision. Suddenly, you have to close the borders. You have to stop all of your men leaving. They have to go and join the army. They have to fight. Now, in that case, they want to fight. But in Russia's case, overnight, they became a pariah and their uh, economy is kind of in free fall to a degree. That's rapid change. That's happening really, really quickly. The problem with climate change is it's very slow moving. And so we're talking about making changes today that hopefully the people in a hundred years time won't suffer and will kind of see the benefits of the changes that we're talking about making today. You can see how politically that is a very difficult sell. And it's a little bit like trying to stop a, uh, a, a an oil tanker. You know, the you get an oil tanker, you increase the power of the engine, you get up to a certain speed. And once you're at that speed, it's quite easy to continue going at that speed. That's a little bit like what's happened now with climate change. We've had the 100 years of you know, industrialization around the world, and that's what's been happening for so long. It's very, very hard to suddenly switch it all off. And so we're in a situation where now that we've decided that it's time to switch it all off, First of all, you have to put the engines, in. you can't just turn off the engines, you have to put them into reverse in order to slow things down. And so we're all going to feel the pain in this regard. And it's, uh, it, it's just, it's kind of worrying to see how this is all taking place. The big news, economically speaking, is the central banks and what they're having to do in order to fight inflation. And I've been talking about this for over a year now, but the ECB last week, the, it, uh, this actually happened last week um, before the episode went out, and I had reported on it, the ECB rate increase of 0.75%. So the 
you know, the Eurozone has really shot up in terms of its rates, but it's nothing compared to the US and the UK. So straight after last week's episode, the Fed did the exact same and they increased their rates in the US by another 0.75%. And what that's done is pushed it up to 4% now in the US. Now remember, they were down at 0.25 not so long ago, and now they're at 4%. So you can see this huge difference this is making to the market. And in addition to that, the Bank of England the next day went and did exactly the same, 0.75% increase to now 3%. And what has this done? Well, this is really where it's kind of, it's hard to kind of predict what's going to happen next. But just after the, um, like, there's an awful lot of uncertainty because the, the, the announcements that were being made with these kind of rate increases were not in any way um, giving any kind of direction of the way it's going. And I'm, I'm actually just reading here what, the, what a one ana- analyst has said. And he says that his, his reading of it was that rates will continue to rise, perhaps more slowly than before, but then perhaps faster than before. That is literally where we are. And so total uncertainty as to what the future holds. The only thing that they do know is that rates will continue to rise. And so how fast will they rise? This is where it's all a little bit uh, concerning. And what happened was the initial rate increase was, um, was put out there and the market sort of in the US, the US uh, S&P 500, which is where all the tech companies and stuff uh, are, are no, that's actually, the the, the NASDAQ is where all the tech companies are. The S&P is like one of the big market indices in the US. And that actually had a little bit of an uptick straight after this rate increase. And it was because the market was sort of interpreting that this was possibly the last increase that was going to happen and that everything was going to improve. And as soon as the Fed chairman saw that, they kind of thought, uh-oh, this, the market seems to be taking this as a positive thing. So he came out and he you know, basically poured water all over that idea. And he said that they were going to continue, there was going to continue to be rates uh, increases. And um, what that did was soon after his announcement, the market fell by an additional 2.5%. And then the following day, it fell by another 1.1%. And so... You can see how what is happening here is the central banks, they have suddenly woken up to the fact that inflation is starting to look like it may be embedded in the economy and that this is something that they are incredibly fearful of because what it will do is get into a wage spiral increase where everybody's wages start going up and everything, basically everything starts going up and there's this uh, meltdown in the economy. And so what the uh, Fed has done is it is basically trying to get to the point where there's absolutely no chance that anybody will read anything positive into their messaging. If they if anyone starts to kind of say, oh, look, the market is starting to heat up a bit, um, you know, and they start to think, let's maybe now is time to buy the dip and start to get into the market. What that does is people will make a little bit of a profit. And as soon as they make a little bit of a profit, it kickstarts private consumption. They start buying things again, and that'll start pushing up inflation once again. And this is the big fear that they have, is that you can do all of this damage to the economy by reducing it, but it doesn't take much to kick off inflation again. So people are very, very concerned that that's what could happen next. And so um, they're, just gonna, they're basically going to keep on knocking that down until such time as the market kind of realizes that wow this is you know these guys are really serious about this and then and only then will it will it possibly start to um, ease off a bit and at the moment the good news is that there is no more meetings uh, on inflation and stuff like that or on interest rate increases until mid december so we have about a month until something like that happens in that in the interim whilst that is happening the midterm elections are going on in america and that is where the party that supports Donald Trump could end up back in power in the Congress and stuff. And obviously that is going to be a big concern if that happens. And then there are some inflation figures due out this Thursday. And so hopefully those will be a bit lower, but if they're not, 
then we could be in some trouble. Now, what I'm going to do with the rest of this episode is I'm going to play you back some of the um, some of the audio from my live stream. And the reason that I'm doing that is just I would like you guys to join me on the live stream if you can. It's actually getting a huge amount of uh, engagement in TikTok. And um, I think that some of you guys that are watching this, that are listening in here today, you might get some benefit from it because you can actually participate in it. And finally, one of the things that uh, I think I mentioned it already just a few minutes ago, but I'm working on a big study at the moment that has been put out by one of the big estate agents. And it, uh, it is on the undersupply of zoned development land for, re for new build residential. And what that is, that is having a massive impact on the market and as one of the root causes behind the housing shortages that there is at the moment. And so that's something that I'm going to be diving into in a kind of a proper dedicated episode in the, uh, in the probably next week. And so I'm going to hand over now to my um, real estate news that I recorded last week during the live stream. Speak to you guys soon. So getting into real estate news, and in particular, we're going to just start off with the typical Financial Times property sector. And this is just covering UK house prices falling in, the, in October as borrowing costs have risen. Now, this has been something that a lot of people have been um, suddenly kind of shocked to find is happening. And that is that the because of the, of the kind of screw up that happened with um, Liz Truss coming into government, announcing this kind of mini budget and saying that they were going to give all this money away. They were going to like uh, reduce the rates that the highest taxpayers paid and all this kind of stuff. There was a huge amount of stuff going on. And the problem is they didn't think it through. They didn't have it properly funded. They didn't know how any of this was going to work. It was all going to be someday in the future. We'll figure out how to kind of manage this. And so what's happened anyway is just to kind of tell you what's explain what's happened is they went and they announced this budget the budget was the reaction from the markets was absolutely catastrophic everybody just basically suddenly looked at upon the uk uh, financial system as being like something from a um, from a developing world country and so something like that you would see in south south america or or, or africa or something like that and whereas before the UK economy was like one of the fourth or fifth most powerful in the world, all of a sudden it was seen as this kind of complete disaster. With that happening, the cost of the pound rose and all of a sudden the borrowing costs have shot up. And what it's done is, is it's caused lots of investors that piled into the market after the pandemic kind of eased off and suddenly property prices went like a freight train flying along. And what's happened is all of a sudden we're into a situation where they are unable to um, sort of see into the future as to what is the borrowing rate going to be. Anyway, West End property prices are falling as well. So look, just across the property market in the UK, this has been a total disaster. And an awful lot of people would have borrowed money to buy property in the uh, just after the pandemic. Prices shot up. I know somebody who was put their pro property on the market and they got an extra something like 150,000 that they didn't expect. And uh, they were shocked by the performance of the market. The people who went and did that, did it because interest rates were at such a low amount for so long. And so we're into a situation now that suddenly those interest rates are starting to creep up and people are now going, uh oh, we're in big trouble. So this is why it's something that we kind of I think you're going to start seeing a lot of property people started to kind of get a bit nervous about what the future holds. UK house builders warning of new rules and taxes are going to add a load. I mean, it's the same going on in the Irish market at the moment. You've got this talk about the uh, the, the cement levy or the mica. Uh, there's this problem in um, in Ireland with uh, concrete that was produced in the uh, in the last kind of. Um, boom. And a lot of houses, like 150,000 houses, 160,000 houses were built with a product that was inferior and it uh, has started to kind of collapse. And um, so there's an awful lot of people that have got houses that are no longer structurally stable. And there's a huge amount of money that has to go into sorting all that out. Anyway, the bottom line is the, uh, the government have suggested that the construction industry should have this 10% levy added on to the cost of every single housing project or every single construction project um, to fund this MICA thing. 
And the problem is that the construction industry is already going through a really difficult time um, with construction cost inflation shooting up. And because it's shot up so quickly, it's, um, it's pushed a lot of developments off the, uh, off the ability to be funded and go timber frame. Absolutely. Now, the only problem with timber frame, as I've discovered recently, is we were doing the development and the timber frame was coming from factories in the, on the continent and abroad and stuff, and we couldn't get the stuff in soon enough. And so we were badly delayed by that. And so this is it. So like everything has some sort of an aspect that can be problematic. Anyway, London Prime property also feeling the real from the mini budget. And so generally speaking, the UK market is in quite a lot of difficulty at the moment. Ireland is not suffering the same amount, but there is definitely a knock on impact. And so we all have to um, we have to be a little bit careful about what's happening in the Irish market. Now, one of the things that I've been predicting on the podcast for the last, I don't know how many weeks at this stage, probably six weeks, I came out with a podcast a few one, uh, episodes back and I said that I thought the housing crisis is about to get worse, a lot worse. And um, sure enough, on Thursday's paper last week, good body stockbrokers came out and said that they are um, predicting a housing supply to fall further behind demand. Now, that means naturally that this is going to make it uh, even worse. Um, so blah, blah, blah is saying, I think the prefabricated house, factory house is the future. I agree with you, definitely. Um, prefabricated in factories. In fact, I know somebody who, who's, in, who's in that whole sort of sector started Century Homes here in Ireland, and, then, and now they're in the US, and they've created a, a very similar project in the US or a company that does all that kind of stuff in the US. So housing supply, anyway, it is in the process of getting worse. Um, we've, we're in a housing crisis. Nobody has ever witnessed or experienced a housing crisis like we are currently going through. And that is why rents are going up. That is why house prices have been going up. But we are in a situation now where when, you're, when you have such acute demand, um, naturally what's going to happen is supply grows in order to meet that demand. And so you put as much... Uh, cost and investment and resources into creating additional supply. The problem is, is that because of the 2008 crash, the global financial crash, most of the Irish market was completely decimated by that. And uh, it, it lost, you know, I, for every two construction jobs, one of those jobs was lost. And so basically 50% of the construction industry lost their job. And so total destroyed the market and because of that a lot of people had to move abroad they went over to canada australia different parts of the world and naturally when you go and move to a place for a couple of years you start to lay down roots uh, you might maybe you meet somebody you have children whatever it might be and suddenly you're not coming back to this market because of that we are now in a situation where we cannot even though we have such acute demand we cannot increase supply to meet that demand so it has really gotten into a very, very problematic uh, area. And um, I just don't think that um, even like if you were to snap your fingers in the morning and be able to double or triple or even quadruple the amount of houses supplied in the market, um, if the funding exists to do that, you still couldn't physically do it because there's not enough contractors, there's not enough labor in the market. And we've got a situation where I, I have a friend who actually supplies housing um, for laborers that are being brought into the Irish market to kind of aid with the construction sector. And she can, cannot get enough houses to actually put people into. And now on top of that, we've got the Ukrainian housing uh, or the Ukrainian refugee crisis. And everybody is, uh, you know, if you have vacant accommodation, the easiest solution is to go straight to um, go straight to it. Now, I see your comment there about the government likes REITs is not helping. You've got to be careful about that because at this moment in time, REITs are actually what is funding the market. Um, like when you're talking about, if you're talking about traditional housing, yes, but REITs tend to go for big apartment developments and the big apartment developments would not be funded unless there was a REIT behind it. You have got to, um, like the big developments like we, we'll be talking about um, current homes building on RTE they're doing 600 units or something like that I mean there's no way that that would be built if REITs did not exist in the market and um, 
the number of yeah exactly the number of REITs is reducing and that is because they are now finding better investment opportunities in the stock market and bond market and the housing market looked like a fantastic thing back when interest rates were at, you know negative and people were sort of saying you know what can we, where can we get the best return and you looked at the how, Irish housing market and you could buy something at three and a half or four percent that was far better than a negative rate return but suddenly it's now we're into a situation where the ECB has been increasing rates. So suddenly a German bond is like 2% or something like that. And when you're comparing 2% against 3% for a big apartment block in Ireland, you kind of think, ah, I think I'll take the German bond because I can offload that with one push of a button. I don't need to manage 200 apartments. I don't need to reinvest. I don't need to do all this kind of stuff. So it is definitely impacting it. And you've got the housing supply. What's happening is, the apartment buildings are probably the biggest way to build, um, uh, to supply the market quickly and get people places to stay. But those developments, they they cannot be, if you were to build 100 apartments in the morning and to sell them on the market, you would lose money. There's absolutely no question about it. It's been proven that the cost of delivering apartment buildings is greater than the value than they are when they're put on the market, with the exception maybe if you're kind of selling in the middle of Dublin 4 or something like that, you know, the highest value area. But the traditional areas where people would be building apartments, they don't make any money at all. The only place that they make money, uh, the only housing units that make money are residential uh, houses, like semi-detached houses and stuff. They're easy to build. Apartments, there's much, much greater rules and regulations around them. And so it's not making any money. And so the way it was working is the big REITs were coming along and they were pre-funding a development. They were they were entering into a forward purchase agreement and that forward purchase agreement would mean that the development, uh, there's no risk to the developer. The developer just has to develop, develop the property and hand it over to the REIT. The problem is now construction costs, because they're shooting up with inflation and all that, the developers are now facing this risk where they've agreed to sell a big apartment building at say 50 million or whatever the, the sale price might be agreed. They might be trying to deliver the project for 35 million. So there's a there's a 15 million sort of there to cover the cost of the site and there's the and the profit is mixed in there somewhere. But all of a sudden you're into a situation where construction prices have increased by 20%. And in addition to that, funding costs have now increased by a similar amount. So you're into a situation where the profit on that project has been squeezed really, really down. Anyway, let's get on to the next thing here. Hammerson submits further plans for O'Connell Street. O'Connell Street is a huge, big um, street, obviously, in Dublin with the GPO. It's a very historic street. Um, and, you know, if you think about Paris, you think about the Champs-Élysées being a beautiful sort of street. The guys in that own the Dundrum Town Centre, they've submitted a major development uh, proposal for O'Connell Street that would develop a a project over five and a half acres of land. So it's it's quite a uh, a promising development. And what they're trying to do is turn O'Connell Street into a really, uh, I suppose, something that it should look like. If you go to the Champs-Élysées, if you go to Paris, Champs-Élysées, walk down that street, it has this grandiose kind of feel to it. Whereas if you walk down O'Connell Street, there's a lot of sort of like pound shops and all of these kind of really um, problematic kind of things. We've also got Cairn Homes have lodged plans for uh, 688 apartments in um, in the RTE. So the land behind RTE is, is about to be developed by Cairn Homes. So that's a major project. They paid 107 million for the site. And that is a, it was an 8.6 acre site way back in 2018. Hard to believe they're only coming to the market with it now, but it just shows you the time it takes for a project to be brought to, um, to completion. Further ECB rate rises flagged as thousands pay more on mortgages. So the, in the last couple of days, uh, the ECB has increased rates by another 0.75%. And this is going to continue going up, I think. I don't think it's anywhere near coming to an end. And so already we're talking about people having to pay close to 300 a month extra. And you can imagine what that's going to do to the market. It's going to mean that the amount of people on the market that would be you know, paying a rate and they would be kind of, you build your life around your mortgage payment and how much you have available to kind of spend on um, additional sort of expenses on, on your 
on your you know holidays or whatever it might be that is all impacted by the amount of left left over after your mortgage payments so suddenly you're going to see i think the economy will suffer a bit of a fallback because of that city plan uh, they're planning a, a 12 buildings of up to 15 stories in dublin 8 that's going to be interesting um, to see whether that actually gets built now in light of what i've been saying about the the market kind of changing one of the things that is interesting to see is there's a Dublin office complex uh, and what they were doing, uh, it was an office building in uh, Park West and they've actually now converted it into a, a housing scheme basically for 200 people. And uh, that's because the office, you know, offices are no longer really considered um, necessary by a lot of organizations. And so it's becoming uh, the go-to thing is to convert them into residential. Dublin City defies planning regulators. So this is an interesting one, just that the, the build to rent rules that Dublin City uh, is actually squabbling with the planning regulators. So you would think that those two things are the same, but actually what they are now is they're at odds with each other. And so it's interesting to see that the actual government, two government departments, essentially, neither of them can agree on something. And so they're actually entering into a squabbling match publicly. And um, do I think that property prices will drop significantly next year? I think there's a risk that they will. And uh, the only thing is, is when you're talking about the Irish market, it's very, very hard to say because the problem is, is that demand and supply are so out of whack. Like normally when, you, you know, if supply is, uh, it, you know, increases massively, then demand falls. But in this market, we just have so much demand that we cannot satisfy it with supply at all, anywhere even closely. Now, what will cause it to fall, prices to fall potentially, are affordability. Um, you cannot buy a house, um, you know, unless you're able to afford the payments. And whatever the payments were 12 months ago, they are much, much higher now. And that is because rates have increased. Interest rates have gone up. And in addition to your interest rate going up on your mortgage, what you're looking at now is you've got an additional uh, payments on your, you know, to fill your car, payments to uh, heat your home, uh, the electricity costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, gas prices have obviously shot up as well. And then in addition to that, what have you got? You've got the cost of grocery shopping and everything. Just inflation in general has shot up. And so it's, um, it's, a, it's a problem, you know. Now, the Doyle Group, this is just what's interesting is the only reason I'm kind of talking about this is they, they were the guys that started the, uh, the, the Jewelry's Hotel, which is kind of famous in Ireland. And Doyle's, um, they had basically uh, gone through the last couple of years. It would have been a tough couple of years with the pandemic and stuff. And all of a sudden it's bouncing back and they've returned to strong um, post-COVID return to, in the leisure market. So it's just interesting to see that things are bouncing back nicely. Um, there's a court case going on at the moment with a couple taking their bank to court over them being given an, uh, an unsuitable mortgage. Now, it's hard to believe, but we're talking about a mortgage that was issued to them in 2007. And uh, here we are 15 years later, and people are still in the process of trying to deal with these problems. So it just shows you to all of you guys that are, we'll say, budding property investors or people who are already investing in property, you need to think carefully about when you're going to go and borrow money. Because a lot of people, they kind of think, oh yeah, I got to jump into the property market and I'm going to go and buy my first property and stuff. But if you get it wrong, this can have a really, really long uh, tail and it can take years to get yourself out of a deal. Now, in my, in my sort of coaching program that I have, I have a mastermind and coaching program. In that, I've gone through some of the deals that I've done that have worked really, really well. And I've gone through the ones that have just been complete fails. And, um, and like in the ones that are fails, I think it took like 12 years to extract ourselves out of the, uh, the project, you know? Do I think there'll be a recession next year? Yeah, I do. That, I, I mean, I'm just going to call what I personally think. Obviously, it's a crystal ball, but um, I do think plans to convert Dublin offices into a hotel. So there is a, uh, there's a developer that um, they bought a, a site in Stevens Green and they wanted to turn it into a office building and they turned it into an office building, they converted and everything like that and it did not work. And so this has happened, I've seen this happen quite a bit um, where 
people are trying to get into office develop into becoming office owners and suddenly there's nobody interested the office market has changed a lot and uh, the pandemic has obviously affected it with people working from home and all that and so we're into a really really difficult situation now for anyone who has got an office portfolio you're starting to think about mm, what's the alternative use and so in this case these guys have converted it into a hotel after they spent a couple of years trying to rent it out as an office building. There's, oh yeah, this is interesting now. Just, we were talking about the, the property market and here's an example now. There's a Dublin for residential portfolio on the market at the moment. And they're looking for, they've got eight townhouses and 35 apartments off the Stilorgan Road. And they are putting them up for sale at 24 million purchase price, uh, which represents a yield of 4.83%. Now, you can go into the uh, stock market, you can go into crypto, you can go into anything like that, but you put your 24 into this, you'll get a 4.3% return on your investment. That's not very high. Um, but then uh, some of the slides that I've got further down, Galway City Residential Investment. Okay, so it's not as big as that other one, but it's they're offering 8.5 million and it's offering a 5.6% yield. So would you prefer to own Houses and apartments in Dublin at 4.8% yield, or would you prefer Galway at 5.6%? It's a small difference, but the locations are very, very different. And uh, it'd be interesting. Now, the, the, the price that you're paying is substantially more. For Dublin, you're talking around 24 million. So it's three times the price, but the yield is pretty close. And personally, I think I would be going for the Dublin before I would go for the Galway. If you found this episode useful thank you for tuning in to another episode of behind the facade uh, if you did find it useful i would be really grateful if you could leave us a review over on itunes or if this is your if you're watching it on youtube maybe just hit like down below and subscribe if you haven't already if you have any questions or topics you would like to ask or have me cover in future episodes you can approach this two ways. If you're listening in on the podcast, then perhaps join the Facebook community. It's called Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, you can leave a comment down below. And I always like getting comments in the YouTube page because it does drive engagement. Uh, alternatively, look me up on social media. My handle is Gavin J. Gallagher, as always. And you can stay up to date on my projects and various things that I'm doing at the moment just by following me over on my newsletter. The newsletter is found in gavinjgallagher.com. I put it out weekly. It's just a bit of an update on things that are going on and the various publications and things like that that I'm putting out. All right, guys. Talk to you again next week.